There we go. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, first off, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out here to uh, the Microtech user meeting. Uh, I believe this is my ninth. I think I missed the very first one, something like that here in the U.S. So uh, thank you for everybody for coming out. If you stopped by my booth, thank you very much. I'm glad you came by. Uh, what we're going to talk about today uh, to wrap up the show is a IPv6 deployment case study that we did. Um, so to get started here real quick, because uh, even though I know a lot of you, I want to make sure everybody understands who I am. Uh, again, my name is Dennis Burgess. I'm a Microtech certified trainer, consultant, um, the author of uh, Learn Router OS. Uh, I've been in the WISP industry since 2000. I've actually been doing dial-up ISP since uh, 95, 96, somewhere in there. Uh, so way back when, I've always been a consultant. I very much enjoy consulting, talking with people, finding and learning uh, all new things. So uh, definitely a, a good way of going. Uh, I have actually in the past life also been a, a Microsoft and Cisco certified. I used to be a CCIE at one point in time. So uh, then I did this little thing called Start a Wisp and I needed to do bandwidth control. So all of a sudden, guess what? I found Microtech and pretty much have not looked back since. Uh, I work with a company called Link Technologies. Uh, again, we do have a booth. You're more than welcome to come out and chit-chat about it. Uh, I don't need to kind of go into all the detail with it because I know we're running out of time, but uh, feel free to visit our website uh, as well. Now, what we're going to cover today is really kind of three different sections. So the very first one is uh, a really, really basic understanding of V6. We're not going to go in-depth on it. We're just going to basically show you a couple differences between IPv6 and IPv4. Uh, and then we're going to cover some common objections to IPv6. We get a lot of people go, oh, I don't want to deploy IPv6 because. So we're going to talk about a few different ways to overcome those objections. And then the very last thing is we're going to show you the little case study. Uh, we did a, uh, a network. It's actually like 69, 68 sites, something like that, uh, both towers and fiber pops, uh, fairly extensive network that we deployed IPv6 on. Um, this was actually a really good part because once we finished all the prep work, uh, it was about 9.30 in the morning, uh, my time, and I called our customer and said, hey, we're deploying V6 today. He says, how long is it going to take? And I'm like, well, I got 68 sites, so probably before noon. And he goes, you mean everybody's going to have V6 addresses after that? And I said, if their devices support it, then yes, everybody will. Uh, so that day we rolled out 16 sextillion IP addresses in one, uh, in between 9.30 a.m. and about noonish, So, definitely uh, fun. So, a little bit about IPv6. Who's using IPv6 now? We got one, two, three, four-ish, five-ish, okay. We got an ish here, you know, half up, half down, okay. Um, for those of you that don't know, especially in the Aaron region, we are definitely running out of IPv4 addresses it will become more and more and more expensive as well as harder to get IPv4 addresses going forward. Uh, and it has been for a little while and it just keeps coming, keep coming, keep coming. So IPv4, really simple, 32-bit uh, number. Everybody knows the dotted decimal notation. However, in IPv6, we have the hexadecimal notation. So what is the difference? Well, it's just a bigger number. It's 128 bits. And then we also have letters. Don't worry, the letters are fine. They're supposed to be there, okay? In IPv6, we definitely have lots and lots of IP addresses, um, orders of magnitude more than V4, and uh, therefore we deploy it definitely differently than we do current V4 networks as well. And as you can see here, uh, the number, number of addresses in IPv4 versus the number of addresses in IPv6, someone will have to Google however many commas that is, because I have no idea what that number is. Uh, I'm sure there's a nomenclature for it, but I do not know what it is. So what is the goal of the transition from IPv4 to IPv6? Now we use that word transition loosely. Even though probably in many of our lifetime, we will see many internet connections with IPv6 connections only at some point in time, currently we would be in what we call a transition phase. We're moving towards it. How quick is that going to be? You know, I've had people tell me, you know, once we run out of V4 and basically it becomes a critical mass, all of a sudden it's going to be real quick. I don't think that's going to happen. I've also heard people say that it's going to uh, basically take 100 years or more because V4 will continue to be used for a long, long time. 
I'm going to say that we're going to be a little better on that, but it's definitely going to be probably 10, 20, 30 years that we're going to be seeing both IPv6 and IPv4 dual stack as native implementations on our networks. So going forward, we're going to see v4 and v6 very consistently, uh, especially probably say in the next two, three years, we're going to see more v6 deployments. It's already on an exponential scale as far as the number of routes going up uh, in the routing table, uh, and it will continue to do so for the next uh, 10, 20 years, uh, if not longer. So what we do during this transition, well, it's a called dual stack, and this is just exactly what it sounds like. We have IPv4 and we have IPv6. Now here's the problem, they're not compatible. They don't talk to each other natively. So that's why we call it dual stack. We actually run two IP protocols all at the same time. Now, as I said, the current rate for IPv4 blocks, if you wanna go lease one, I can tell you right now, you can go lease a slash 24 of IPv4 addresses in the Aaron region right now. I can get them all day long, but it's gonna cost you 2,500 bucks a year to lease those. They've already figured out, we're not gonna sell them, we're just gonna lease them into uh, perpetuity so that you always have to pay a yearly rate. And I guarantee you that number is probably gonna go up uh, as the, the next year or two uh, goes. So as of this morning, Aaron region had this many IPv4s in inventory. The big number here is the slash 23 that you see there. Right now, the majority of their assignments are going to be slash 23s. They've downgraded from slash 22s. They're now at slash 23s. And there's only 185 of those left. Not a whole lot of IPs, seeing that you have the entire North American area, et cetera, requesting IPs from Aaron, and there's 185 left. So you can see how that is going to disappear rather quickly. Uh, probably, another, again, a year or two, we see a lot of people renumbering, restructuring, changing things, trying to make more use of the IP addresses they have. Uh, and then again, we also see people that are leasing IPs. Uh, I believe Microsoft uh, paid, what was it, 20 billion or something like that for Xerox, I think it was, a, a couple years ago. And the whole point of that was is to get uh, 16 slash 16s from Xerox. So Microsoft wouldn't run out of IPs. That was one of their primary motivations to purchase that company. So. It's definitely getting, uh, it's getting slim pickings, as I said. Something else, you can go to Aaron.net, uh, and this, this little image here is right online. It is updated live as they allocate, so you can always see how much uh, IP address space they have. So next, let's talk about IPv6 deployment issues. Now, how many people have ran into issues trying to deploy IPv6? Nobody. Man, I, I must like be the, the glutton for punishment because every other company calls me up and this upstream don't support it or this don't work or this router don't work, you name it. Well, let's first off start uh, with, with getting around the issues. The very first thing is getting your initial allocation. Uh, then the typical minimum ISP allocation in the Aaron region is a slash 32. This is a massive amount of IPv6 space. Uh, how hard is it to get this initial allocation. It's actually really easy. The hard part is getting what we call the AS number, or the autonomous system number. That's actually really easy as long as you're going to deploy V6. So the example is, is can we get a V6 address from Aaron? So we have our own IPv6. Of course we can. How much does that cost? It's about 2000 a year for that. You have additional costs though of uh, your AS number. I believe it's 500 for the first year and 100, uh, I believe it's 100 after that. Um, but you have to qualify. You have to be able to be dual homed or something like that to get an AS number, right? Well, not really. There's actually another section for what we call special routing circumstances. And you basically call them up and say, hey, I'm deploying V6 and I have to create a tunnel with uh, HE for V6 for a dual peer, so I need an autonomous system number. And that qualifies. So it's very, very, uh, it's not difficult, that is, to get an autonomous system number with Aaron especially if your goal is to get IPv6 addresses and deploy them. Uh, if you're just wanting v4 and you don't have multi-home or you don't have any special routing uh, circumstances, it will definitely take uh, a lot longer, but uh, typically it's not too difficult. So that's one issue that we get is people go, where do I get the IPs? Um, just so you know, we have uh, one provider, Cogent, and they gave us a slash uh, 48 whenever we get signed up if you wanted it. 
Uh, we actually handed it back because we got our own slash 32 now, but uh, the point was that they, they are definitely handing it out as well from your upstreams. So that's actually the second issue. Does your upstream support it? And I guarantee you there's probably a half of people in this room that if they called their upstream, their transit provider, and said, hey, I need IPv6 access, they're going to go IPv what? Little question mark. I guarantee it. And then they're going to go up to tier two, tier three, and eventually you might find someone that goes, well, we're thinking about it. Uh, so it, it does happen. What we do see is a lot of the tier one providers, uh, the, the multinational networks, uh, Cogent, Hurricane, level three, these types of providers. And there's definitely others out there. I'm not uh, picking on these guys. I'm just naming a couple of them that I know that already have a global dual stack network that you can peer with very easily. Uh, I have asked AT&T and Charter uh, for the past five years, when are they gonna support it in the Midwest region anyway? And the answer is, well, it's coming. And then I tell Charter, well, it's been coming for the past three years, and I still don't have any of any information. So that is a, it is a concern, and I know that they have been working on it, but you'll have to work with your upstream in those cases to see if you can get that peer. Now, what if they don't give you an IPv6 peer? In other words, they don't have IPv6 transit. Well, there's actually a number of companies. Uh, Hurricane Electric is one of them, and then there is uh, another one uh, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but there's at least two networks that will give you a free IPv6 transit peer over your six to four tunneling protocol. All of this is, of course, supported by Microtech. Uh, and one of them is, of course, Hurricane Electric. Uh, they, they tout themselves. They have a whole bunch of peering points all over the country, and they will give you a full internet IPv6 routing table uh, over a six to four tunnel uh, if your upstream does not support that. There are limitations to that in overall bandwidth usage. Uh, I believe it's a data rate, but overall it definitely does work and will get you going and started uh, with that. Uh, as I said, you will get your assignment from Aaron. I kind of covered this. Uh, and just remember, your dual stack network is not going to be compatible. So as you continue to implement this, once you start it, okay, uh, once you get around these issues, you, you get your IP blocks from Aaron, you'd start dual stacking. Now, with your servers, you're gonna have to have V6 and V4 IPs. Uh, for anybody on Microsoft servers, that means you have to upgrade from 2003 servers, okay? You, you, you actually have to have a decent server OS on that. Uh, but any of your applications, you're gonna have to put both a V4 IP address and a V6 IP address. And we see a lot of companies that run servers, they, they basically mirror it. They have a slash 24 here, and they have a slash 64 here, and they basically mirror the same IP, so if it's, uh, the last octet is 221, then the last octet of the V6 address is 221. So they don't try to make it uh, overly complicated, even though they have a lot more address space uh, in the V6 64s. So how do we implement this? Um, there are several transitions methodologies. We're going to cover one of them. Uh, you can do six to four tunneling, as I said, if you only have one peer and you want a second peer, a uh, hurricane does that as well as some other ones. Uh, most common though is going to be a dual stack. If you're with, again, uh, cogent, hurricane, those types of providers, dual stack is definitely the way you want to go because there's nothing, uh, no intermediary tunnels in that. Uh, but that really depends on the hardware, software you use, as well as your upstreams as well. So. Let's talk about this V6 deployment because that's really what everybody wants to see. How do, how do we do it, okay? So what we did in this case is we want to deploy a 60 plus tower network, a POP network. We actually had a couple pluses on this network. The very first thing is we pretty much did everything with PPOE. Every customer is authenticated via PPOE. How many people use PPOE in this room? I got one, two, three, four, okay. Everybody else use PPOE. All right, um, because PPOE makes uh, prefix delegation, it makes authentication, it makes bandwidth controls so, so simple. It is very uh, and highly recommend, I would highly recommend that. So what we did is we did PPOE, we already had that. We used prefix, de prefix delegation in IPv6. We used OSPF v3, so this is the OSPF version three for IPv6. And then, of course, we used BGP with IPv6 in this network to connect to our peers and announce our IPv6 block. So this is an example of the network. It's actually not the whole network. Uh, it is a very complicated network. There's a lot of rings. There's a lot of uh, redundant connections in it. 
Um, there is a mix of 10 gig, one gig fiber. There's some 100 meg fiber in there. There's a whole crap load of wireless links. There's dedicated uh, license links. There's unlicensed links. Uh, again, it's a typical WISP network that they start building up and they keep upgrading and they keep upgrading. So, so here was our deployment plan. Uh, the very first thing, we want IPv6 across all sites. Pretty simple. Uh, we want to give a block to each customer at each site. So how does this work? Unlike IPv4, in many cases you will have a CPE that then has NAT, so the customer gets a private address. V6 does not use NAT, so every customer is going to have to get at least a small block of IPs assigned to them on the inside of their router. Now we use a thing called prefix delegation, so we delegate an entire prefix from a prefix pool to hand that information off to that client. So if my CPE is sitting here when PPOE dials out, as soon as I get connected, the router, my router, hands me in a slash 64 of IPs, of IPv6 IPs. And then my router places that slash 64 on its LAN connection, and then all my computers will do a stateless auto configure for those IP addresses. So every device has a public. Now, for uh, disclosure here, whenever you do this, keep in mind that now you're giving every device behind the customer LAN an IPv6 public IP. So you may need to build a couple firewall rules to help your customers protect themselves because a lot of times they have no idea that this is actually occurring in that their computer is directly accessible, okay? Uh, so that's the very first thing. We're gonna give each customer, if they request it, a slash 64 of IPs. Uh, we're gonna ensure the network security and bandwidth control. We wanna make sure that their V6 performance is just as good, if not better, than their V4 bandwidth. But also, we don't want to allocate more bandwidth for V6. So we don't want them to get on a V6 site all of a sudden and actually have more bandwidth allocation than what they're paying for. Uh, we also have to add BGP sessions for our transit providers. Transit providers are anybody that provides uh, a full table or default route to the internet. So i.e. you can access the entire internet. And then in this particular case, the customer is on a peering exchange, a fairly large one. So we have a whole bunch of BGP peering peers on the peering exchange uh, that we talked to and that we would have to upgrade them to IPv6 or add IPv6 for them as well. We also had to have a plan for say a, a bigger business that has multiple subnets inside. How do they get v6 access in our case we made a one-off plan that if a customer requested it we could assign something like a uh, 48 uh, a number of slash 64s to that customer if they wish to so uh as i said we also worked with alan uh, aaron to get the v6 uh, allocation that was actually the easiest part i bet you we had that in three four days it, it really was not hard at all uh it was very very quick to get that so now we get into the BGP. So the very first thing we did is we configured BGP because we want our AS to be announced and our prefix to be announced to the internet, okay? So with that, what we have is we added the BGP sessions for our transit providers. So the, one of these transit providers happened to be Cogent. Cogent, we called them up, said we need IPv6. They sat there on the phone, they go, okay. And they gave us a slash 112 uh, IPv6 prefix. And what that is, that's just for communication, their router, our router, very similar to the slash 30, okay? Once they give us that 112, they went ahead and configured an IPv6 peer. And in this particular case, we actually have two peers with them. Even though we only have one connection, we have two BGP sessions. The first session, IPv4, and the second session is IPv6. Even though we can support IPv4 and IPv6 address families in one session. Most of our transit providers and pretty much every peering exchange I've worked with, it's always gonna be two, one for V6, one for V4, okay? Next, we took any of these existing BGP peers, all these uh, 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 peering, uh, peering companies uh, on the peering exchange. The peering exchange already had allocated a slash 111 for IPv6 addresses on top of the peering exchange. So all the uh, participants of the peering exchange would get an IP in the slash 111. And then all we have to do is contact them through our normal uh, peering contacts. Say, hey, we want to turn up V6 with you. Here's our prefix, here's our AS number. 
uh, and then they'll typically reply, yes, we do it, no, we don't, et cetera, uh, and then we turn those up. Once we had all of our BGP connectivity up and running, we have to test. What's the very first thing you do? You, you always test. So we configured a slash 64 off our core network. Uh, we actually configured a little bit of OSPF v3 from our edges to our core routers uh, so that we could basically take a laptop, set it there, and go, hey, can we get v6 access? And uh, in our case, the, the easiest way is, you know, can you ping I, uh, ipv6.google.com? Uh, can you ping ipv6.facebook.com? Uh, and uh, also linktext.net, it's all IPv6 enabled, so can we get to v6 sites? And we actually had this uh, wonderful issue that uh, their DNS server wouldn't upgrade it enough, so the DNS server did not hand out quad A records, in other words, IPv6 records. So we couldn't get to anything, we couldn't get to anything v6 anyway. So uh, it actually took us about another week for their DNS guys to get in there and upgrade their servers so that we could actually receive IPv6 uh, addresses in DNS. Once we had that, everything worked like a champ. Uh, IPv6 addresses was uh, uh, resolving, and uh, you go to Facebook, Google, YouTube, all those sites are already v6 enabled, so immediately you got the v6 addressing, and uh, overall, uh, in general, we've seen almost a, a better performance in the v6 protocol in these instances uh, versus v4. Maybe that's because uh, uh, the protocol is newer, maybe that's because the servers are lighter used, take your pick, but it definitely worked and we didn't have any issues with that. So what we ended up with is uh, uh, two transit providers, two IPv6 transit providers. We had eight other uh, IPv6 peerings. Uh, there was uh, 138 something peers and unfortunately only eight, other, eight of those offered v6 uh, peering. Uh, I believe a good chunk of those though are also on the route servers on that so they probably didn't just directly peer with us. So in this case, uh, we had uh, about 42,000, 40, uh, 42,600 IPv6 routes, about 22,700 active routes uh, on there. Now, uh, for those of you that are on peering exchanges, we actually had an interesting conversation with Hurricane Electric. We do not buy uh, transit from Hurricane Electric, but we peered with them on the peering exchange so we can get to their customers quicker. And uh, they basically said uh, try, they're trying to uh, maybe corner the market in IPv6. I don't think that they'll do that, but they're trying very hard. And they literally said, hey, now that we got your peer up and where you're, you're getting hurricanes, uh, all the prefixes from hurricane, what we, we're, we're going to do is, if you want, we can turn up IPv6 transit. So in other words, hurricane gave us a full IPv6 routing table in IPv6 uh, on the, uh, across the peering exchange. So they gave us basically IPv6 transit. So in our case, we ended up with three uh, IPv6 transit peerings uh, because one of them was on our peering exchange, which is kind of uh, nifty uh, and help, uh, not necessarily helped out, but definitely uh, gave us an alternate path as well. Something else that uh, you may wish to look at. There is a little dispute on the internet between two different companies, Cogent and Hurricane. Uh, I don't really care which one's at fault anymore. I just want them to fix it. But they refuse to peer with each other in IPv6. And therefore, what we get is uh, there's about 300 routes on Coge and about 1,400 uh, prefixes on Hurricane that are not on each other. So in other words, there's 1,400 prefixes on Hurricane that if you're on a Cogent-only connection, you can't get to from Cogent and vice versa. So uh, something else we see this a lot is uh, if you peer with Cogent directly or you buy transit from Cogent, definitely go ahead and get a Hurricane route server, uh, one of the six to four peers, so that you can uh, get the rest of those routes from Hurricane so you can reach the entire IPv6 internet. Uh, second, if you are a Cogent or Hurricane customer, please email them and complain about once a month so hopefully they'll peer with each other and everybody will be happy. So overall, once we had the testing up and running, our laptops worked, our devices worked. Uh, once we got this quad A DNS issue solved, everything worked. Speed tests were the same, if not better. Uh, IPv6 was working, resolving just fine. Now we were ready to roll it out to our 60 site network. So let's talk about our site router configuration. I know some people have actually talked about scripting here, so we will, uh, Try not to continue on with that. But what we did is uh, a lot of the router OSs out in the field did not have IPv6 package installed. By default, uh, let me phrase this, the package would be installed, but it wasn't enabled. 
So we had to go ahead and get in there and enable those packages. Well, what we did is we took uh, all of our loopback addresses, so we know all of our router IPs easy enough, and we use a little utility that we offer called PushScript. It is free. You're welcome to download it. Uh, there's a URL. Basically what this does is this SSH is from our management system to each router, runs a little script. That script enabled IPv6, uh, the IPv6 package rather, and then uh, it sat there and uh, created an event that would schedule a reboot of those routers at 2 a.m. if they needed that package enabled. So uh, literally we waited to the next day and uh, in many cases, uh, again, the IPv6 package would be installed, but it wasn't enabled. So once we got that, uh, we also told the routers if we needed to, to go ahead and FTP uh, or fetch from an FTP server, the latest version of router OS. If we're gonna reboot the routers, we might as well upgrade them, right? Uh, so we did that and then we waited uh, overnight. We came in uh, the next morning and guess what? The whole network was still running. <laughs> Scary, right? <laughs> Woo, yeah. Uh, however, once we came in, uh, we, we had installed, uh, uh, IPv6 was installed, everything looked great, uh, and then uh, we used another small script to remove any of the scheduled tasks uh, from all of our routers uh, in usually a few seconds uh, to get that done. So now we have IPv6 package running on all of our devices across our network, and all of our devices are upgraded to the latest version. So hey, now we're, now we're looking really good. So next we had to create the uh, site routing. So what we decided on in this particular network case based on their current tower site distribution and clientele at each pop was a slash 56 uh, prefix for each site. Uh, I believe that gives us uh, 256 slash 64s on each site. Uh, we, we deemed that that was enough for each site for the customers that would get IPv6 and if we ever need more we can give those. But uh, the other thing it gives us is what we call an align prefix. And align prefix in v6 is really simple. Basically it gives us a very easy way to uh, number our IPs without having to break up uh, a whole bunch of uh, complicated routing very quickly. So in this particular case uh, the align prefix is you know, 100, 200, 300, etc. So we just simply added those very easily uh, to get those uh, align prefixes. Once we deployed all of our IPs, uh, as you see with our li aligned prefixes, we have 100, 200, 300. It was very, very easy for us to deploy V6. V6 is not that complicated. It works just like IPv4, just with letters and uh, numbers, and it's a lot bigger. Once we did that, we basically took our OSPF area, we deployed IPv6. Uh, with our slash 32, we have 16.7 uh, million slash 56s. And in our case, we only used like 68 of them. So <laughs> now we, we get to the point of how big V6 is. We have a lot of IPs. So in this uh, deployment, again, we, we used the slash fit, uh, 56s for each site, and then we deployed slash 64s to each customer. We then went to OSPF V3. We created a configuration for those. Uh, in our case, we basically turned everybody onto passive, so every interface into passive, because we don't want anybody to talk OSPF uh, v3 unless we know about it. And then we simply enabled any interface that went between point-to-point, -point, fiber links, et cetera, and configured their cost accordingly to our uh, network plan. Once this was done, we then went to our OSPF uh, area range, and we created an area down here at the bottom uh, used our area ID of v4, and we created a new area. And we do this because we want to make sure we filter out anything smaller than a 56. We don't want to see 64s in our OSPF uh, v3 table. Okay, we want to get the slash 56 to the tower site, and then the tower site knows where the 64 is. So we don't need anything more or further than that. So in this case, uh, again, we, I think we, like I said, we had 70 route, uh, IPv6 routes in our OSPF v3. We created the area, and then in our uh, area range, we simply added the slash 56 to be added. Uh, I also believe we added a route filter in there to ensure that we block anything, uh, any slash 64 from going into OSPF, because we didn't want that at all. Now, this is kind of a, I, I've heard people say this is good and bad, it works out for us, so I'm not going to argue uh, with the results, but we also uh, simply used our 
uh, local link address for OSPF communications. So whenever you bring up your uh, IPv6 interface, it will create this FE80, uh, FE80 IP automatically. And we just let OSPF use those. We did not need to add slash 112s between sites. We just used the local links. Now, when we do this, we could have added like a whole bunch of slash 127s. That's a pain. We don't need all those routes. We didn't do that. We just used the local links. However, whenever you do a trace route in V6, here's outbound. As you can see, what we get is we actually get the uh, 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 loopback address uh, the top most IP in the slash 56 in all the uh, uh, trace routes. So we don't see the FEs, the, the local links at all. Uh, inbound, if we do the same thing, again, we see all the actual router IDs instead of the uh, local link IPs. So you don't really have to worry about uh, individual IPv6 addressing between all of your devices. I do know plenty of companies that do that. So I'm not saying it's wrong, it's just up to you on how you wish to deploy V6. The last step is to get the IPs to our customers. So this is using PPOE, we simply go to IPv6 and pool, and we create a pool. So every pool is gonna give us a prefix, so in our case, a slash 56, that's the slash 56 we assign to that router, and then we give a prefix length, in our case, a slash 64. Over in our PPP profile, we have this wonderful DHCP V6 PD pool option. In this, we simply select that IPv6 pool. What this does is as the clients connect, we immediately take the slash 56 and we assign a prefix length of a slash 64 to each customer that requests a DHCP v6 uh, prefix delegation. So in other words, their CPE or whatever the device they're using for uh, their uh, uh, PPOE client has to support v6 addressing for this to work. Otherwise, they don't get one. So a good, side, uh, a good side, let's say it had 200 customers on it, we probably got 30 to 60 IPv6 uh, slash 64 is assigned, okay? But we don't have to track them. We don't have to track them because they're automatically assigned. So if we keep going over here, one of the beautiful things with PPOE, for those that don't use it, you go to Active Connections, you bump everybody, immediately they start coming back, and within a few seconds, you probably have all of your customers online. And if we looked at our used prefixes, we can see exactly which prefix went to which uh, the owners of DACP, and if we track down the info, it'll tell us exactly which uh, PPOE session got that IPv6 address. Now, what did we do to get all this done? Well, we got the error allocation, we created the peers, uh, we updated the routes, enabled IPv6 packages, rebooted if required, uh, we configured OSPF v3 on those routers as well, and then we configured the PPP uh, on each router to assign the IPv6 prefix delegation. The very last thing we did, which um, my customer kind of was on the, the edge about, he's like, you're going to bump all my customers between 9.30 a.m. And, uh, and, and noon? I'm like, yeah, I am. And he goes, okay, get it done. So uh, you, you may have different uh, plans in that case, if that makes sense. What's really nice about this, though, is that since your bandwidth controls are all done based off of PPPoE interface, we don't have to change anything. PPP, the PPoE interface doesn't care if it's IPv6 only, IPv4, et cetera. It's just an interface that, with speed limits. So all of our speed restrictions still apply uh, cumulatively between v4 and v6. So if you're downloading it uh, uh, from a website on v6 and you start another download, you still only get, in this case, the, the five meg that the customer is supposed to get, okay? Now, how long did this take? I'm gonna give you a, a rough time frame. It could definitely go quicker, it could definitely go longer. Uh, we probably had a, a week into getting that allocation from Aaron. Uh, honestly, maybe two or three hours, maybe four hours. I, I probably put higher numbers than normal. Maybe four hours of actual consulting work that I did to get that to work with Aaron to get that done. Uh, one day to prep our edge and core devices, uh, really two hours of my time to get that done, uh, mostly to enable IPv6 and to do the configurations. Uh, it took about two weeks to get the v, uh, IPv6 BGP sessions on both transit and the peers that we offered, and that is mostly just emails back and forth trying to get them to, hey, I want to form a relationship or get an IPv6 address from you, let's, let's get that taken care of. So it really wasn't like it was a whole lot of hours, it was more just time working with those providers. Uh, we had one month of testing, 
Uh, this is once everything was working, we left it off and we had a couple customers and a couple of very specific locations uh, in the knock uh, use it to make sure they didn't have any problems. Uh, it probably took us two of those four hours to realize that we wasn't getting uh, IPv6 quad a, quad a records from their DNS servers. Because we're sitting there going, well, it, Facebook works, but it doesn't say it's v6. It says it's v4. What, what's up with that? Uh, and then checking the configurations, making sure we didn't do anything incorrectly. Uh, two days to upgrade routers. Now we did that by doing scripts, waiting overnight, and then uh, finishing it up. If you have a smaller or larger network that you wish to do that in some other automated or non-automated way, go for it. And then uh, the very last thing, again, it was literally uh, 9.30 a.m. to about noon for me to do the final rollout, which is to log into each router, put the IP addresses, assign the pool, uh, assign the pool prefix delegation to the PPOE sessions, and bump all those. Uh, if you wanted to do that in a script, you could do that as well. In my case, I wanted to double check and triple check, and I also need to uh, look at some of the routers to verify interfaces where uh, OSPF was on the proper interfaces to make sure uh, our OSPF connection came up. So in all, less than two months easily, and that's uh, a lot of IPs from, hey, let's start thinking about deploying IPv6 to getting it done with our own slash 32 from Aaron. Uh, definitely less than 40 hours of consulting time for me to get that done. It was uh, probably quite a bit less. Uh, really, I think the longest thing was waiting for the peers to uh, contact us back uh, and get there. As far as other things that I would do differently, you know, uh, I don't think there was anything that we could do better except uh, definitely we should have checked the DNS servers or at least asked them that make sure IPv6 uh, was supported and it was returning results. Uh, I think that was probably the, the only other major issue that we had. Uh, keep in mind that you do not have to have a DNS server that has an IPv6 address to return v6 addresses. It would be preferred, but it doesn't have to. Uh, an IPv4 DNS server uh, can return quad A records uh, as well. So overall, went very, very well. Customers very happy. And I hope that my experience will help you guys in your IPv6 deployments as they are coming in the future. With that said, and I know everybody's ready, any questions about IPv6 deployments, et cetera? No. No. So the, the question was is if the customer CPE does not support, uh, or I'm sorry, does support V6, does the WAN port get the IPv6? The answer is no. You, you have, there is no such thing as NAT in V6. It doesn't bridge. Literally what should happen is they will get a uh, V6 address from the uh, uh, prefix. So the PPOE session comes up and that slash 64 actually comes on the LAN and then it routes through the router. So it's, it's full-blown routing. They just have a lot of IPs on their LAN. So, you know, and, and uh, I will tell you this, again, make sure your firewalls are configured because I've had some weird stuff come off printers that get IPv6 addresses. So, any other questions? IPv6 and the CPE does, then they'll still be able to work using IPv4 going out. Correct. The, the way the IPv6 protocol works, at least in uh, most Windows systems, is it will attempt to connect on IPv6 if it gets a quad A record. If it cannot connect on that, then it will go, uh, drop down to IPv4. Most people never even notice that they're on V6 or, or not using fix V6 anymore during that process. So. Any other questions, queries, posers, other informational tidbits, or is everybody ready to go play in the sand? Nobody. They're like, no, we're ready to get out of here. All right, thank you very much.